friends, hi, this is Dr. Shonali Chandra and I welcome you all to our YouTube channel, Medicine Decoded. Now friends, obstetric causes are one of the most important and common causes of disseminated intravascular coagulation. So there lies the need to going back to the basics and understanding the pathophysiology of DIC in a more conceptual way. Now what exactly is DIC? It's not per se a primary disorder but a secondary manifestation of something else or some other triggering event that is going on in our uh, body. So what happens in DIC as the name suggests is there is excessive stimulation of the coagulation system of our body which leads to widespread thrombus formation in the microvascular systemic circulation which can be generalized, it could be involving certain organ systems or could be uh, localized and when we look deeper to see as to what is happening inside these uh, blood vessels is that there is widespread thrombus formation and when fibrin forms during this clot formation or thrombus formation platelets are consumed, the clotting factors are consumed in the process and that paradoxically yes leads to bleeding manifestations and that's not all I mean these thrombus which are there in the systemic circulation of the peripheral capillaries or the small and medium sized arteries can clog the system and lead to tissue ischemia, tissue hypoxia and create a circulatory shock kind of a state and even worsen the circulatory shock leading to eventually maybe even multi-organ system failure. To go deeper into the understanding of the pathophysiology of DIC, you also need to be aware of the normal physiology of thrombosis, right? The normal anticoagulation system and the coagulation system of our body, right? I've already taken up a video on the physiology of thrombosis in this channel itself. You can have a look at it. However, I will also give you an overview of the coagulation and the anticoagulation system of the body and its key aspects. So, in a week, clotting happens or thrombosis happens by the extrinsic pathway that is initiated by the release of tissue factor. So we can see a tissue factor on the surface of the endothelial cells which leads to further activation of the coagulation system factor 7, factor 10 ultimately leading to this principal molecule which is thrombin and thrombin converts uh, you know fibrinogen to a uh, fibrin clot and this is the clot formation, right? Thrombin also leads to more platelet recruitment into this area of endothelial damage here, right? More recruitment of platelets, these are activated platelets which take part in the thrombus formation. Clotting factors are consumed in the process. So this is the physiological basis briefly of thrombosis. Other than that, yes, the body has to maintain a homeostasis in a manner that the clot only happens uh, at the level of the endothelial injury and does not extend further than that. So there has to be a limitation of this clotting at the same time as well. So there are many anti-clotting or anticoagulant factors which are expressed by normal healthy endothelial cells uh, of our body like we have the heparin like molecules, a tissue factor pathway inhibitor, right? And one of the important factors here I particularly want to emphasize on is thrombo modulin right so we see here that thrombin has been involved in the process of fibrin clot formation at the site of endothelial injury right and then you know it is this very same thrombin that is going to be swept away into the circulation where it is going to encounter the normal or the healthy endothelial lining of the blood vessels right and there it is going to bind to this molecule on the surface of the endothelial cells which is thrombomodulin and that binding is going to activate protein C this is activated protein C which is going to further set into motion the the anticoagulation system that will operate to limit the extension of this thrombus formation. And at the same time, the healthy endothelial cells exhibit this factor which is called as the tissue plasminogen activator which converts uh, plasminogen to plasmin and it is this plasmin which will break down the fibrin clot and in the process uh, you know release fibrin degradation products. So this is the fibrinolytic uh, pathway which operates 
to limit further extension of this clot formation right so the clot formation normally will be limited only to the site of injury or endothelial injury and not extend towards healthy endothelium when this physiology is clear we can clearly understand that dic will set in when there is overwhelming thrombin formation which will overwhelm the anticoagulant or the fibrinolytic capacity of our body so broadly speaking when you want to identify or when you look at the factors that can incite or trigger dic in our body uh, it could be any condition which leads to excessive release of tissue factor which can lead to excessive uh, thrombus uh, formation or there can be widespread endothelial damage in the systemic circulation which can trigger excessive thrombus formation right so all the causes of dic one or the other modality operates or sometimes even may be a mixture of the two and one such very very important cause of dic is septic shock and septicemia in which there is again widespread endothelial injury because of a factor which is called as the tumor necrosis factor here now this tumor necrosis factor also upregulates or stimulates the expression of tissue factor in the endothelial cells it is going to inhibit uh, the expression of thrombomodulin which is the anticoagulant factor on the endothelial cells and this tumor necrosis factor also leads to the expression of adhesion molecules on the endothelial cells which attract and bind to the circulating wbcs and these white blood cells now they're going to release you know proteases or reactive oxygen species which can then trigger widespread endothelial damage right uh, so giving rise to the uh, basic inciting uh, you know event or the triggering event to to set into motion a disseminated intravascular coagulation the coagulation system you know gets into overdrive and so does the fibrinolytic system here so there is excessive generation of fibrin degradation products as well so yes the coagulation system and the fibrinolytic system are on overdrive and it seems as if the patient is drowning in his own blood so now that we understand the pathophysiology we can enumerate the conditions which can lead to dic and apart from septicemia obstetric complications they top the list that's because the placenta can be a source of tissue factor that is also called as thromboplastin right so in conditions like placental abruption the tissue factor can leak into the systemic circulation triggering dic conditions like intrauterine fetal till death where a dead fetus has been retained for a prolonged duration of time can lead to leakage of tissue factor from the placenta into the systemic circulation or there can be retained products of conception and that will happen particularly in the incidence of a septic abortion where the uh, where apart from release of thromboplastin another factor that operates is sepsis and there can be conditions like amniotic fluid embolism where uh, tissue factor thromboplastin present in the amniotic fluid can leak into the systemic circulation and then trigger dic so keeping the obstetric causes aside the other conditions which can lead to dic is one that i've already discussed and that is sepsis and septicemia to add another element to it there can be endotoxin related injury to the endothelial cells as well and there can be a massive trauma massive tissue injury which can release tissue factor into systemic circulation and it can also trigger endothelial injury also at the same time and the condition kind of gets intertwined and entangled especially in you know critically ill patients who are in the icu because you know they have also other comorbidities they have maybe circulatory shock maybe hypoxia or acidosis which further worsens endothelial injury an element of sepsis and bacterial infection particularly with endotoxin producing organisms makes the chances of dic in these critically ill patients even more likely right 
Moving on, the other causes can be severe burns. Yes, even severe burns can trigger uh, tissue injury, endothelial injury, release of uh, uh, tissue factor as well as widespread endothelial damage. Uh, certain malignancies like uh, leukemias and, uh, you know, adenocarcinomas, they have also been shown to uh, trigger inciting events leading to DIC. Another cause is uh, toxins uh, in the body. Toxins could be in the form of snake bite also for that matter. And again, I told you about endotoxin related uh, injury to the endothelial cells as well. And then a widespread massive deposition of antigen antibody complexes in the systemic circulation, which can then trigger, you know, the complement activation in the body leading to widespread platelet activation or widespread WBC activation further leading to endothelial damage. So whatever be the triggering event or a condition which has led to DIC, pathophysiologically it can be explained by either excessive release of tissue factor or other procoagulants into the systemic circulation or by excessive endothelial injury, a widespread endothelial injury in the systemic circulation or even a combination of both. So to summarize, massive tissue destruction, products of conception broadly, sepsis broadly, endothelial injury broadly, broadly all of these triggering events can lead to release of tissue factor into the systemic circulation, which can then lead to widespread microvascular coagulation. Endothelial injury leads to widespread microvascular coagulation. And this coagulation will lead to ischemic tissue injury at various sites. Organs of importance like the kidneys can get involved, the lungs, the liver, and the brain can get involved in this ischemic process, the clotting factors and the platelets are consumed. That leads to bleeding manifestations in a patient with DIC. Massive uh, coagulation also triggers and puts the plasmin activation on overdrive, the fibrinolytic system in overdrive and there is excessive fibrinolysis leading to excessive release of fibrin degradation products which can be used as a marker or a lab marker for identifying DIC as well. Another thing that happens because of widespread microvascular coagulation occurs because of the vascular occlusion that these uh, thrombus uh, Cause, right? So the RBCs get squeezed through those, uh, uh, you know, occluded vessels and the RBCs can get trapped in this thrombus formation leading to microangiopathic hemolysis and the manifestations of microangiopathic hemolysis. So when you look at the clinical presentation of a patient with DIC, there is some evidence of underlying triggering event. And other than that, uh, the clinical presentation can be acute, sudden, fulminant, as that happens with in a patient with sepsis or amniotic fluid embolism or massive uh, circulatory shock uh, with the placental abruption. So there can be fulminant presentation or presentation could be in the form of uh, microangiopathic hemolytic anemia. So that is more sort of an insidious and you know chronic presentation as well. It can be in the form of organ system involvement also. So in critically ill patients, uh, obviously with an underlying triggering factor uh, identifiable or maybe sometimes even not identifiable features like dyspnea, cyanosis, respiratory failure or brain involvement like with like convulsions and coma or renal system involvement like with oliguria and acute renal failure. So multi-organ system involvement and their manifestations can be the clinical presentation of DIC and even sudden or progressive circulatory shock. So sometimes even after massive hemorrhage and circulatory shock, especially in critically ill patients, DIC can also set in there. So all in all, when the presentation of DIC is sudden, acute and fulminant, as in sepsis or amniotic fluid embolism or placental abruption, 
there is more of you know bleeding diastasis or bleeding manifestations that happen right so a dic let's say for example setting in a patient with the placental abruption will present more with a postpartum hemorrhage uh, for that matter or let's say with amniotic fluid embolism also it will present with postpartum hemorrhage right and dic that progresses more insidiously and a chronic presentation of dic can manifest with thrombotic manifestations leading to ischemic tissue injury like changes in organ system involvement so broadly this is the distinction that needs to be understood now let's talk about the diagnosis of dic the diagnosis will be based on the clinical profile of the patient right so there is going to be some underlying you know uh, triggering event which can be identified in the clinical profile other than that lab parameters are going to help us make the diagnosis so uh, i have this diagram here on the right to help you remember uh, the lab parameters which are which are deranged in dic so i told you yes that the platelets are consumed in the process of massive widespread thrombosis so the platelet count is going to be decreased and low and yes the clotting factors are consumed in the process so yes serum fibrinogen levels are going to be low and because the clotting factors are anyways consumed so when we go for the pt and the aptt test as a part of coagulation profile these aptt and pt are uh, timings they are all prolonged and yes i told you that the fibrinolytic system is also on an overdrive because of this massive and widespread clot formation and there is excessive generation of fibridin uh, degradation products uh, very particularly d dimer levels so the d dimer levels are going to be elevated so the diagnosis of dic will be based under the appropriate clinical profile and clinical setting with the help of these lab parameters and we can also look for evidence of micro angiopathic hemolysis uh, based on the liver function tests and the peripheral smear findings as well so this is in brief about dic disseminated intravascular coagulation so many times in my lectures in obstetric patients we keep saying there is risk of dic this is dic and it is time that we go back to basics and strengthen our concepts about this manifestation which can have many underlying triggering events mm -hmm.